exhibition. The first room is devoted to cottons. And uh, Banu is going to join me yes. to speak Apologies, on this topic. But first, I want to thank those who've been very, very special to us in organizing this exhibition. Not only the collectors, Banu and Jivak Parpia, whose knowledge and experience has led us all, but Rosemary Krill, from formerly of the uh, Victoria and Albert Museum, London, and one of the renowned experts in the field of Indian textiles, has joined us as our co-curator and our guide and inspiration for the installation of this show. And one of her ideas was to simplify the arrangement into three major topics, cotton, silk, and gold, and adding pashmina and wool because it's so important to the field of Indian textiles. So, Banu, would you join me to begin with the Jamdanis and talking about this subject? Certainly. Now, let me first say that how delighted Jivak and I are to be ambassadors for Indian textiles, for their, their importance and their beauty, and this exhibition has allowed us to do that. I also want to add my vote of thanks to the Museum of Fine Arts Houston, everyone on the team, especially to the, direct, the vision and the leadership of Director Gary Tintero, and the same vote of thanks to MAP, to the team at MAP, and founder and director um, Abhishek Podar, my dear friend. So now, uh, let's start with um, Indian cottons, because the story of Indian textiles is the story of Indian cotton, and nothing represents Indian cotton more than these fine muslins. If the camera can focus in on, zoom in on some of them, that would be really wonderful while I'm talking. Um, these are four examples, quintessential examples of um, cotton fiber in India and cotton muslins, which were made in the northeast part of India, in where Calcutta and um, Dhaka are. They're known as Dhaka, especially to the Indians who would be very familiar with it. The first one here is made for Western trade. If you can see the, the subtlety of the pattern, it's all white on white. The second one, that maybe we can focus on with the blue borders is really a great example of um, Indian Jamdani work. It's weft float textile. It's got this lovely embellishment with the indigo blue cotton fiber and the gossamer nature of it. The really fineness of these muslins is quite spectacular. The final one there, maybe you can focus on, has some metal thread in there. And this is a really also a real masterpiece in this group. Can we hand it over now to Sarah? We are now going to move to the global aspect of cottons and introduce Sarah Fee, who will talk with us about Kalamkaris. Sarah. Thank you, Amy. Thank you, Banu. Thank you, everyone, for being here today. So as Amy and Banu explained, this is a room about cotton. Um, but when I look around, of course, what I see, and I'm sure you will too, is color and pattern, these really vibrant colors and amazing designs in these about 19 pieces uh, that um, from the Parpia collection that speak to what can be called kalamkari or chintz, and that is applying color to um, the surface of the cloth. Now, India, as I'm sure you all know, dominated this uh, ability to get cotton to take color and pattern for thousands of years, up until about the year 1800. All the world was coming to India for these cloths, and Indian artisans tailored them to each market. So we're going to start, and I've just chose four or five of my favorites from the room that I think speak to various points about them. Start with this piece right here with me, and if uh, we can zoom in on some of the detail that was made for um, the Sri Lanka market, actually. And it really shows us the control that Indian artisans have um, of their uh, medium. They use two methods to get this color onto the cotton, either uh, using a column pen, which is a sharpened um, pen, or they used uh, carved blocks. We'll be seeing some of each of those. So this is really a masterpiece of the column pen. And what also gave India an advantage, as I'm sure you all know, were the potent dye sources that were indigenous to India. 
India, especially the Chayavar uh, root. So that's what gave these amazing reds. And if you look really closely into the flowers that we see here, you can see that there's intricate design in white, and that's actually made with wax. So they were painting wax on to get those little details before it went into the red dye bath. Now this is a very popular motif in Sri Lanka, this flowering tree, but if we move to the piece on the right, which was actually made for the European market, um, tell me if I'm positioned so people can actually see it, this is a fragment of what would have been an enormous hanging that would have hung in an 18th century European home known as a palampore. It too was a flowering tree, and if we zoom in on some of the details, you can just see how exquisitely drawn and all of the care that the artisans took to represent uh, these various flowers. Now, some of the flowers we know, um, we can identify. We see here probably chrysanthemum and a peony, and some of them may have been um, coming from the artist's imagination. But you can just see uh, with the tendrils and with, again, the wax infill, just how exquisitely drawn and made these were. I'm going to walk us along um, this beautiful wall that shows other pieces made as well um, for the European market, but we also have one piece and a very rare one made for the Persian market that's been quilted. And as somebody pointed out to me, the quilting in this really makes the color sparkle and come to life in a different way than some of the others. One of the major markets for these Indian uh, painted and printed textiles was Indonesia. And whereas very few older pieces survive in India today, it's from Indonesia that pieces have been found um, up to five or 600 years old that were preserved as family heirlooms in um, several islands of Indonesia. <clears throat> so of all these Ind pieces made from the Indonesian market, I'm first going to stop us on this very large, enormous piece, and I hope you can see the scale. Uh, I'll stand here in front of it for just a second so you can see. Now this enormous piece, whereas the first ones we looked at would have been furnishing fabrics, this one would, would have been made as dress, an enormous wrapper that probably um, uh, an elite in Java or Sumatra would have worn as an enormous wrapper known as a dodot. It would have been worn in various layers and belted and would have been an extraordinarily large and amazing garment. Now this one again, from a distance, it may look like patchwork. Uh, it may look like it was block printed, but in fact, every single cell in this has been hand drawn. And if we can zoom in and look at some of them, uh, you can see that there are repeats, but none of them are entirely alike, so it's really a virtual also piece of the artisan's design. Now, I didn't mention it, but it wasn't a single artisan that would have made any of these pieces. You would have first had a master drawer. You would have then had different uh, groups dying for the different colors, for the blues and the reds. Uh, the red, again, coming from the Chayavar plant, which is native to India the blues from the indigo ferrotanctoria, also native to India. And you would have had different groups washing, um, finishing, polishing, and then um, often beating the cloth to give it a shine. So this is an extraordinary piece and I'm just thrilled every time I see it. I'm gonna end with just um, two more uh, pieces. If we keep walking around, we're going to come first to this long, narrow, cloth that also would have been made for the Indonesian market um, for groups uh, living in the highlands of Sulawesi who used these long narrow pieces um, for ceremonial purposes. They were owned by clans and they would have been brought out and hung for very precious um, events and that is why they have lasted so long. This one has been dated to the 15th or 16th century, and I think you can understand why India dominated this um, cotton painting and printing, because after five or 600 years, look how vibrant these colors still are. These always amaze me. Now, this is the first one that we've seen that would have been made actually not by painting with the column, but using blocks. And I think from a distance, you can see these big, large divisions that would have been used, um, made by enormous blocks used for the outlines, but then there's hand-painted detail 
within. Now this is um, this exuberant uh, forest or vegetation that has ties to um, Jane painting and that also has helped scholars to date these pieces. Now I'm going to end here with pieces that were actually made for the domestic markets, so made in India for Indian patrons. They weren't, of course, only desired internationally, but also locally. So we have, I'll move over here, <clears throat> we have this set of four pieces, and um, the two at the top, and this, this one on the right, would have been block prints as well, so um, the artisan would have used wooden, hand-carved wooden blocks to apply each color. A different block was required for each of these colors. Now we see here various floral motifs that were popular in India. Uh, here we have a coxcomb, we have irises, and at the very top we have an unknown plant. But I hope you will agree with me that these are as fine as the painted ones that we see. Sometimes in this discussion of art and craft, there's a tendency to elevate those that are hand-drawn over those that are block printed, but I'm really thrilled to see in this exhibit that they've all been put on the same standing and um, considered in the same way. So I wanted to thank the Parpias for having shared this amazing collection. And I'm going to now turn it over to Amy again. Thank you, and please join us in the next section of the exhibition. We're just going to spend a moment in this corner to see another facet of trade textiles in this wonderfully and important vision of elephants and mahouts. And this is a very, very special object for this collection in our section devoted to ikat, another important important uh, technique that is known throughout the world. And not only does the collection include some extraordinary patola saris, which you can see here, but a, a rare piece that comes from Jagannath Temple that relates the wonderful story of the Geet Govind and the devotion to the god Krishna. I'm going to turn over the mic to our wonderful host, Banu, who would like to speak with you about a very, very special tradition of ikats from South India. So thank you, Amy. We're all familiar, at least the audience in India will be very familiar with patola, but I should just add that they are yarn dyed textiles. The warp and weft is dyed off the loom and then they are woven together and you get these fantastical patterns. You showed the trade one, but even these in the center are just extraordinary examples of patola work in the town of Patan, Gujarat. And we're very privileged to have these in the collection. Now, we know this, this patola for silk. It's a silk technique, but there is another ikat, which is an ikat in cotton. And maybe we can shift to this wall where they are displayed. Um, thank you. Um, and look at these two examples that are included here in this show, um, which show the extraordinary drawing of Thalia Romans and, and execution of Thalia Romans. The word Thalia is, of course, oil. So the resist is an oil resist. So they have a specific smell when you first get them. And even over time, it's not easy to get rid of that Thalia smell. But look at the extraordinary expression of aesthetic. Here, this, is, this one is embroidered over the ikat. Amy? I'd like to move along, if we can, to one of the favored areas of collecting. This example is one of the finest kantas em embroideries from the area of Bengal. And while the family has published very recently many of the kantas in their collection, they fortunately have permitted us to introduce this as one of the signature pieces of the exhibition. And if you look very closely to the registers at the bottom of this uh, textile, 
you'll see many small vignettes that relate to activities that actually took place in Calcutta in this period, at the end of the 19th century. And they are celebrated more and more times. Why would it be in a textile like this? This type of textile, known as kanta, was made in the household by the woman of the house. All of the kantas and the ones you see behind me as well. And they're made from threads of cotton that are taken from old textiles and reused. That's another facet of this that makes it very, very unusual. And in fact, the tradition continues today. But what really is outstanding here is that you can read into this the maker's response to what's happening around her, outside of her household. If we look at the bottom register and we see the three vignettes that are shown there with figures and a figural decoration, they're not just a man and woman. There's a very dangerous topic that's being related there. And there was in the newspapers of Calcutta at that time what was known as the Elokeshi scandal. And it's represented here where we see that a young bride has gone off to, uh, to with her priest, the Mahant, and when she returns, she's accused of having an affair with him and is murdered by her husband. This is a, a very, very troubling thing to find in a textile, and yet it's celebrated by her as something that should be included in all the activities of, this, of her life, including what's happening in the town that she comes from. We don't know where that was precisely, but there is no other kanta that we have seen that so vividly relates not only these activities, but also the wonderful floral and other decorations that are incorporated. We are now going to look behind me at other embroideries of this region while we move to South India and Bana will speak with us about some pieces that are very, very special to her family. Thank you, Amy. Um, yes, so we move from this cotton wall that is showing uh, kantas and uh, cotton orissa sari, which is also quite beautiful, to this wall of three where we selected three South Indian Chetinad saris and the aesthetic of South India, as we all know, so different from the North. North is floral and, uh, you know, very exuberant. The, this aesthetic is simple, but it's no less extraordinary. In fact, it is one of my favorite aesthetics. It's um, simple stripes or checks in vivid, bold colors. Um, the one here is really striking. It must have been wonderful when born. The center one which maybe we can um, focus on, was Jivak's mother's sari, which she treasured and she wore a lot. And um, we're delighted to see that it is one of the masterpieces in our collection and we're thrilled to have it. The one next to it, the one with the orange and the red, also the, the weaver has woven the orange border separately, no red warp in the orange, so that it highlights that um, orange, it pops in addition to the next to the red. So yes, I'm delighted to have South India represented by these three saris. Okay, Amy. I'm very honored to introduce my colleague, Janice Leoshko from the University of Texas, Austin, who will now speak. So unlike what you've heard already, I want to stand back and realize what a wonderful, wonderful opportunity we have to look at textiles in museums and to think about the context of textiles in museums. As Banu just pointed out, this wonderful sari, once worn by someone she dearly knew, is now hanging for us to look at. We lose the context of its wonderful wearer, of its wonderful shape and movement. But what we gain is the ability to look closely, which the experts here in looking at textiles have demonstrated is a phenomenal opportunity. But it's something that's hard for us to keep in mind right now when we're in museums and we don't have people pointing these things out to us, they become to some degree distant. 
And why is that? And we have to recognize that museums, as wonderful as they are, as places for us to look at material, bear also um, a, a responsibility, all museums, to present the fact that there were certain legacies of looking that unfortunately left out the people of many parts of the world who made these objects. There's even in India, the a renowned Ananda Kumara Swami, who started looking at textiles as part of his earliest work in Sri Lanka, who knew the names of the textile makers as well as other craft makers, who looked carefully and understood how to determine quality representing intellectual input of these master artists. But their names are not always forefronted in his writing. Why is that? We have to look at the fact that colonialism and certain hierarchies of oil painting reduce these works, unfortunately, in the West and in the East to ideas of craft. Craft is a wonderful category to open up, to think about, exploit, and to perhaps still think is valid, but not valid in addition to fine art, is the very heart, soul, and head of the people who made these works that we can now look at. So when we come to a museum, although we can't hold the objects, we can certainly spend time in front of them. And while we can't, because museums don't give us enough chairs, we can think about them when we're away from the museum and study them and begin to realize that we are united in the world, perhaps most fully, by the idea of cloth and its production, for which India has obviously the main um, significant place in the world. So we're really lucky here in Texas to be able to see these wonderful works that have been collected. When you look at things in museums, think about the textiles in relation to not just the wearers and not just the makers, but you yourselves. Thank you so much, Janice for inspiring us, and we're going to continue that conversation a little later at the end of our tour. And right now, I'm going to move with our camera into the third section of our exhibition, where Kristen McKnight Seti is going to speak with us on the objects here. Unfortunately, with so many textiles from the past, we don't know the names of the embroiderers or the weavers. And so looking really closely at the objects is one way we can gain insight into the people who made them, their lives, um, something about their contribution, their artistic contribution. So I thought we'd start here with this. We have a wonderful uh, wall here, of beautiful uh, pashmina uh, shawls and fragments uh, from Kashmir. And I wanted to start with this moonshawl quilt, which I find really fantastic on a number of levels. Technically, it's really exquisite. If you zoom in closely, we see certainly this dramatic uh, moon medallion, which we know was a popular motif uh, for the Iranian market. But we also see in the details of the weaving, the kani or the tapestry technique um, that was used to, in which the weaver laboriously changed the colors of the threads to create the pattern. The dramatic striping um, is quite compelling and something we see in other works of art, certainly um, in, in Iran. And then we have those wonderful botas um, or floral spur rays uh, flowering trees throughout. 
What I would love to draw your attention to is actually the right corner and the upper, um, upper and lower right corners of this quilt um, because you can see that it has been patched. So it's not, you notice how the stripe stops and we see that an extra piece has been patched here, which suggests to me that this textile um, had another life. Um, it, looked, it looked maybe different from what we see now. Um, and at some point in its history, maybe there was damage or maybe the size was changed. We see patching occur to kind of recreate this wonderful symmetrical composition that we have now, um, but maybe wasn't the original intention. Um, and also just to notice in addition to that weaving, we do have a quilting of this textile. So we have additional layers of the hand, both the hand of the weaver as well as the hand of the embroiderer. In this section here, we have a number of wonderful fragments of, of shawls, um, uh, also made from Pashmina goat, Pashmina, um, and from Kashmir. And the, what I'd love to draw your attention to, in addition to these wonderful fragments that feature the bota um, in a variety of, of different uh, iterations, we also have this, this kind of unusual, very sort of British style uh, floral sperm or flowering tree, which to my eye looks very much like something out of the arts and crafts movement. Um, and surely this piece was intended for the European, perhaps the British market, in the same way that, that the moonshot was likely intended for the Iranian market. If we come over here to some of the embroideries that we have, um, we've got two textiles here which we can identify as bulkaris or bogs, and I'll start here with this um, really densely embroidered bulkari, which we could call a bog. Um, and one of the things, there are a number of things I notice when I see this. Um, if we zoom in, you can notice the way that it's made. This large cloth is actually made up of four smaller strips of fabric. So if you notice, we've got seams that run along different places on the cloth, which suggests that the artist was taking narrower strips of woven cover, um, hand spun, hand woven uh, cotton fabric, piecing them together um, and embroidering. In this piece, what we notice is actually the embroidery occurred first. So in those narrow strips of cotton fabric, the embroiderer stitched the wonderful uh, motifs that you see here, very typical of Bukhari embroidery, uh, made with silk floss, it's untwisted or unplied silk putt. And then later the piece, the, the stitching occurred to piece this large piece together. Um, that tells us a couple of things. It tells us how the embroiderer made this, the time um, that it took, and sort of in which order she was working. Um, it also tells us something about um, actual and we can pretty safely uh, attribute this to the region of, of sort of undivided Punjab, which is now in Pakistan. Um, I also want to point out this wonderful mirror that we see here in that sort of in the middle on the right um, edge, which when I see a single mirror like this in a Pulkari, I immediately think it's a, a Nazarbuti. It's something to ward off the evil eye, used as protection. And then on the opposite side where we have these fantastical, um, fantastical colors um, embroidered in a kind of triangular motif, that to me uh, is reminiscent of the Gungat uh, Bulkaris that we have in which, and suggests the way that maybe the woman who wore this textile originally might have worn it with that most decorative um, part of the Bulkari um, hung directly over her head. Moving on to this Bulkari here, um, we have a very different kind of palette, color palette um, at, at work. Instead of the, the rougher color um, dyed likely with mother that we saw in the earlier Bulkari, here we have a Bulkari that is um, actually embroidered on a very, a much finer, undyed um, cotton base. A couple things I notice here, again, like the other Pulkari, this one is pieced from four narrower strips of fabric and has been pieced together. But what's unusual here is that the central um, central motifs that we see, which I to me look like cathars or daggers, um, were embroidered after the four strips were pieced together, whereas the border elements were, were embroidered before. Um, 
so we also it gives us some sense of the labor involved in making this and the time involved in making this. If you zoom in on, on the border element, you can see um, the seam where the pieces are pinned together, and you can also see the variation of color, um, the way that some of the green silk threads look darker, some of them look a little bit lighter. That also suggests to me that uh, the woman who was embroidering this piece was perhaps buying that silk putt at different times, possibly from different suppliers, possibly from different dye lots. So we have slight variations um, that suggest not only the range of the various places where these things might have come from, but also the time in which it took to make this. So this was something that was created over time and very, very much a labor of love. Um, and these were all very personal textiles, things that would have been worn um, by a woman for a special occasion like a wedding. If we, if we come to look at this, um, also a wedding shawl, but this one um, made for a man, worn by a man. Um, and what I love about this is we have some wonderful layers of technique happening. So if you look closely at the base fabric, and maybe we can zoom in um, just above the embroidery, you can see very clearly that this cotton base was, is block printed um, and, and, and resist dyed. You can see where the blocks don't exactly line up, which again show us the hand of the maker, which is very exciting. Um, we also notice that it was made from two strips of fabric um, that have been beautifully embroidered or stitched together. And then at, the, at this most exquisite um, sort of bottom layer of the piece, we see um, embroidery and we see such a density of embroidery. This is the Paco stitch um, that they've used here, which creates a wonderful three dimensionality um, to the stitching and things that look like floral sprays, as well as stylized peacocks that we see up here. Um, so this, like the two Pulkaris, um, that were from in the area that is now Pakistan. Um, this piece here we see is from Sindh. Um, and then I'll just finish with one last piece from Sindh that we can see if we go to the center of the room. And this to me is um, a really charming object. Uh, this is a, uh, an angarko that was um, made for a child, likely worn by a child. And what I find to be absolutely extraordinary here is the embroidery. If you can zoom in on this, um, we see a couple of different things. We see this beautiful green sort of mushroom uh, silk, um, sort of satin uh, weave silk base. And the interior is lined with a, a plain weave cotton and red. But what, it, what is really extraordinary about this piece is the chain stitch embroidery, um, the density of that chain stitch embroidery, and the way in which the embroiderer has pulled, in some pieces of the buttonhole stitch, has pulled the, the fabric apart to create almost like a lace work or an open work. Um, so really exquisite. Um, I imagine that it might have been worn by, by a little prince, um, or certainly uh, for a very special occasion, um, another example of a textile made um, with a great deal of love. Kristen, thank you so much for bringing these to life. We know Fulcaris have always been a special interest of yours, and you're one of the great experts in that field, and we're so privileged to have you with us today. Thank you. We can continue looking at embroideries as we move to another section of our exhibition where we are looking at other garments in the collection. And if we turn here, I'm going to ask Banu to talk about this jablu, that's something very close to her own tradition. So, uh, <clears throat> those in India may recognize this jablu, which I hope the camera will focus in on, to show the exquisite imagery, the design, the proportions, and of course the embroidery technique, which just brings this garment up, up to, to life. Um, it's, of course, the Parsi community that had a preference for these Chinese motifs, Chinese embroiderers. But then you see on the yoke and on the sleeves the peacock motif, which just says it's not Chinese, it is definitely Parsi. Um, we have two Parsi saris in, also included in the um, exhibition, which are on this wall. They are not Gara saris like we normally think of as Parsi saris, but earlier they predate the Gara in terms of embroidery. And they have these Kashmir shawl-like borders or pallus. 
the pallu on each of these is not just a single pallu but there are two so this one is maybe a less elaborate one the one inside that is rolled is maybe more elaborate and um, the same thing for the red and the white one on the top of it so Basis had a real preference for embroidery and as we all know they were um, traders at the time of the East India Company they traded in cotton in opium and other things and were wealthy prosperous community in India. Amy? If we turn and just see the walls behind me, we're looking at some of the most glorious pieces in this exhibition. And these are made of cotton and silk, woven and painted. And I think that we should just focus on a number of these that are so special in the exhibition. Can we walk over to this Chandari Dupata? Beloved by Banu Parpia and now one of our favorite pieces in this exhibition. We want to draw your attention not only to this very subtle color, but also to the extraordinary border and the figural decoration in the corners. Also, if you look above at a Pythony border that is attached actually to a newer fabric, you see the tradition that this piece at the bottom refers to with these repeated floral motifs. Flowers are very much a part of the decoration, border decoration, and we can see here at the right, perhaps the most important object of this area of the exhibition in this another gold piece that is actually entirely woven with gold threads, gold wrapped around silk threads. We can marvel at the border at the right and left, but it's the, the body and field of this uh, garment that really ex shows the expression of the artist and the real fineness, even in something that is so difficult uh, to achieve has brought it life and it's full of life. And you see that it's shown in a very different way than the other objects in the exhibition because of the actual weight of this piece and the fragility of the, of the heaviness of this hanging. We're so pleased to have it in the exhibition. And with the short time that we have, I just want to conclude with one other piece at the end of the exhibition. And that is this Pichwai that is celebrating the Hindu divinity, Krishna. And we see how unusual this Pichwai is. It was intended to be hung at an altar uh, and the figure of the divinity would be in front of it. He doesn't even have to be here. We know his presence is felt by the beloved gopis who stand there with their fans and their fly whisks ready to present garlands to the divinity. And below the gopas, the cowherd boys, and these cows that look like they too are looking up to the god, who is represented by the kadamba tree in full bloom. If we focus on another facet of this, which is a pond before them, and very often we see water, but seldom is it so alive with aquatic plants with birds, water birds, and also fish flying out of the water. It's absolutely wonderful. But all of this is set on a red ground, and that very unusual color sets this aside from many others. We find those largely in South India, around Hyderabad, where they were made for followers of this sect. And we know, very importantly, that this came from a family uh, from, who had moved from the north to Hyderabad. And with that, we'd like to turn our attention to our wonderful hosts at MAP and have a chance to walk with you back through the exhibition and to a place where we can be seated with you. Thank you, Amy. We're just following our camera as we talk, and we're going to meet you shortly in the front of the exhibition. Thank you, Amy and Banu. This has been a special treat 
for our audience here at MAP and to get a chance to virtually have a look at this show, which many of us would not have had the chance to physically go to. So thank you for making this possible and for having all the experts talk to us about these amazing textiles. <clears throat> um, it's great to see many similarities that MAP also has in the collection, which I'm not sure they would match up to the quality that Jeeva and Banu have collected, but uh, it's delightful to make these connections. Wonderful. So, in fact, this walkthrough, Abhishek, allowed the textiles themselves to speak. I know we were all speaking, but I hope the audience got an appreciation with the zooming in of the camera so that the textiles <coughs> could then speak for themselves and with the wonderful commentary that we got from all our speakers here. I wish you all could have been at the yesterday's session. They did a marvelous job at, at the panel. Amy. Well, we would like to also have an opportunity to talk with you as textiles textiles are a very important part of the MAP collection and we'd like to hear from you with your questions to us Abhishek about the textiles that are shown here this is a very very special approach to textiles and very individualized and I'm sure your audience would like to hear about that yeah so I'd like to start by asking Banu how do you go about selecting what gets into the collection I mean you guys have been looking at textiles forever and looking at the quality that you've picked up, how do you go about it? Do you all have to both decide on a piece? How do you find it? Where do you look for it? And what are the fights that you all have internally? <laughs> yeah, thank you, Abhishek. That's a really important question. I was going to comment a little bit on our collecting approach, and now you've given me the opportunity to do that. Um, yeah, we have collected always aesthetically. So it's not to be encyclopedic or to be representative or to be, you know, by technique. It's always if the piece really speaks to us and appeals to us, then we say yes. Uh, and we say, let's definitely go for it. Um, we are both academics, as you know, so we have limited resources. We have to be very, very sure that the piece entering this collection is the right one and fits into the overall thing. And, you know, even if we had unlimited resources, you can't have every, to have a collection, you have to be focused, you have to be disciplined. Not everything that crosses your path goes into the collection. Very dis discerning is very important. Um, Jivak and I definitely have to agree on the piece that comes in. So it's not only one person making the decision. If he sees something in London, he'll send me some picture and he'll say, I really like this, what, what do you think? Shall we do it? Is it appropriate of sometimes the cost is prohibitive and we can't do it so that's what's uh, informed and led to our collection and we're very pleased to be able to share it I think sharing it is really the joy um, of any collecting and um, the Houston response has been just overwhelming it really has I think Amy will say something about how their outreach has led to all the Indian community coming together here many programs and so on we still have time in the next few weeks to come and visit the exhibition, but we have a special department that's devoted to community engagement. And over the past year, with that department, led by Lourdes Ramon, we were able to reach out to over 50 organizations in Houston alone. And those people have joined us, not only for discussion that's led to programming that we never imagined, but they have brought these people into the museum for multiple visits. Fantastic. Thank you for doing that. Uh, Banu, who generally wins in the event? It's uh, one wants to buy it, the other doesn't want to buy it. What happens in yes, that so scenario? I will say I have won on the red pitch by Abhishek. <laughs> it was something I'm that... I'm so glad you did. <laughs> that would exactly. have been a was... big loss if it wasn't in the collection. <laughs> it would have been in the map collection had it not been in ours. But, um, you know, we were very lucky to see these two pitch vies in a, in a Sotheby's auction a long time ago. And um, one is in fact hanging on long-term loan in the Indian galleries here at 
a museum of fine art. So that was the one that Jeevak really liked. He said, no, this is a Janmashtami. It is really important. We need this one. And I said, no, the other one is much more beautiful. We've got to get that. So we got both. We ended up getting both. <laughs> that was the, one of the contentious examples, yes. Tell me, are there any pieces that you are missing in the collection that you would, uh, that you miss, that you would really like to have, which are not here? Yes, well, the pitch fight that you got in London is an extraordinary piece. And I think you were there. Congratulations to you for that coup. It was incredible. But yes, we look for, what I'm really looking for is a good example of an early Kurupur sari, impossible to find. And I hope you will find it or somebody will find it because those are important. You know, they, um, the Philadelphia Museum has Stella's Kurupur, three or four of them. Uh, the uh, VNA has one piece which is in the Queen's collection. They're not easy to find, and I think maybe they're all gone. But they, and Matabel's book, Textile Museum, has one which is quite extraordinary. But those are really rare, special, special pieces. But there's a fantastic piece at the Egmo Museum in Chennai, which I saw. But um, in fact, the, these were really made for the royal family of Tanjore, and I even reached out to them, but you know, they haven't really lasted. And what they are doing today is a far cry from what used to happen. Uh, tell me about the three secret textiles that you all are gunning for right now that we don't yet know uh, that, about. That is, a, that is a big secret. <laughs> no, but you know, the sale, a sale is coming up, which you're aware of, of uh, Mokotov's textiles, which were the early Hiramanic pieces, you know, um, which is going to come up at Christie's. Um, I think we should all go to take a look. There is a pitch fire amongst the, the sale at Kids Christie's. So I would say you should come over to New York, come and visit your daughter, come and visit us and come and see it. So do come. <laughs> uh, a little question about care and looking after these pieces. I've been to your beautiful home, seen some of them there, but textiles require a lot of space. They also require a lot of care. How do you manage this? And how yes, often do you so get a chance to see them? That is, that is a real problem with textiles. But what we are very fortunate with, the museum in, at Cornell introduced us to an art warehouse which deals with museum storage. So it has got humidity control, temperature control, good security, and we are lucky to have space there. So we store them in solander boxes, the folded ones. There are lots of rolls. A lot of them are rolled and stored there. Some of them are framed and mounted, as you see here. So they also go into storage, some of them there. That's how we deal with the storage handling. And we don't get to see some of them. It's really a long time before we see them. There's one Deccan scroll, which we just pulled out and we took a look at. Spectacular painted cloth. Um, early, uh, you know, one of those painted scrolls that tells the story of a local hero and the, the gods that come down to help him through his, uh, you know, warfare and all that. It's just extraordinary. We haven't seen it for 15 years. So we Are pulled these it out. Are the painted good... scrolls from Telangana, the vertical ones? Yes, yes. The yep. painted ones from Telangana. And it's a horizontal Super. format, not a vertical format. Yes. yes. Uh, I think there are some questions and I have the privilege of speaking to you and picking up the phone, but I think Many people from the audience have questions. So Anu, may I please request you to take them while I turn my video off. Thank you so much, uh, Abhishek. Thank you so much, Museum of Fine Arts. Uh, thank you, Amy, Janice, Kristin, Sarah, Panu. It was, been, it was lovely. And I think we have a couple of questions from our audience now. Um, so one of the questions is, how has the response been from the local community, especially people who are not from uh, of South Asian origin? I'm so glad that somebody has brought that question to our attention. And I think our speakers can uh, report this as they've been here now for two days with programming. And I would say that we have, while we've been thrilled to have our South Asian community join us, and a large portion of visitors come from that group, sometimes up to 2,000 people in a day. But most of our visitors are our members. 
our members who come from many different backgrounds, from many different cultures. We've had at our program yesterday, we had people from South America, we had people from all over the United States who had joined us and others who had flown in from different countries. Uh, but the day-to-day -day visitors are very mixed. This is an extremely diverse community in Houston and our main idea is that everybody is welcome, but we want to make sure that we represent the cultures that are shown in our collections and bring those audiences here. I should just add that, you know, when we opened the show, there were reviews in Houston, a lot of reviews. And one was a Chinese TV uh, program that showed the entire thing in Chinese. Spent 10 minutes, we couldn't understand one thing, remember? And um, we were just thrilled, delighted to see them look so closely at the textiles, to report it so carefully in Chinese to their community. So it has been really rewarding, very, very nice. It's, it's always lovely when you have uh, people engaged with our collection and with the museum space. Um, another question we have is contextualizing pieces that have meaning, whether personal or on, on a community level, is always difficult. How has it been managing this nuanced process? In our exhibitions, we generally do not have long explanatory labels, but we have decided that by focusing on where something comes from, a short introduction to its technique, but most of all to talk about what you see in front of you and to encourage people to look very closely. And that is something so, so very gratifying to us as curators and as educators here in the MFA. We also are fortunately situated across the hall from uh, another exhibition looking at contemporary Indian textiles and some of our Indian jewelry and decorative arts, giving that kind of context to the exhibition. And that was an idea formulated by Gary Tintero, our director, and we are thrilled to have things that then lead people to our permanent installation of the arts of India. And also we should mention that there is a library that is wonderful across from us and they have pulled all the books of these authors who are with us, Rosemary Krill and many other publications uh, that are revolved around this particular collection and people are there reading. They come from here, they spend the whole day, they go to the library and return to look again. I, I don't think we've seen anything quite like that and we're so appreciative. Lovely. Um, we also have a question from a young designer who wants to know how they can go about showcasing their work in a museum. I think, I think we'd like to ask Sarah. Maybe Sarah. Sarah and, and Chris have recently had exhibitions and worked on projects related to this. They, they could answer that too. is yeah that's an interesting and not an easy answer uh, I'm afraid you know every museum is different um, I, I think the the first step is of course um, to go about and um, maybe contact uh, departments within museums to talk to them about what you're doing and to send a portfolio so we understand um, it's it's always, there's always limited space within museum exhibits. And, and one thing um, that I have to say as well, uh, that Banu and the question I brought up about storage is because textiles are so light sensitive, we can usually only ever have textiles out on display for six months. So it can be challenging for us to, to mount textile exhibits. We can't do them as often as we, were, we would like. There's also, um, I'm not sure if you're thinking about displaying or if you're t thinking about you know, the retail shops within museums, um, but that's another way to get um, products known and out there. And I'm sure Kristen also has ideas. I was, I was going to say retail could be one way. Um, not necessarily in terms of museums, but one thing to think about is 
if your if the work that you're interested in showing is um, not uh, is more for sort of aesthetics or would, would you like to have shown in a gallery situation um, there are a number of commercial galleries um, that do show textiles um, and certainly uh, feature the work of contemporary designers if um, if the designer is working with there are also a lot of markets um, that feature high quality work um, that are around the world um, and I think if, if designers for example um, are working with indigenous textile making communities with printers and embroiderers um, or weavers um, then markets like the International Folk Art Market in Santa Fe might be one venue to sell um, to sell their work so I, I would encourage you to look also at sort of the commercial side and some of those um, other um, sort of market driven opportunities as well in addition to museums. This is Kamini Sani here. I'm the director of MAP and I'd like to come along just to say thank you to all of you, Banu Bhartia, Amy Poster, Sarah Fee, Janice Lyoshko and Kristen Sethi. This is the third iteration of Insider's View. Uh, we had Sohanya Raphael from N Plus do the first one. Uh, and then we had, of course, the Asian Art Museum uh, with Forrest McGill leading us through their exhibition. And we've been quite adventurous, adventurous in this one because you've actually walked us through the gallery. We haven't done that before. And I, it's added a whole new dimension to it. Thank you so much, all five of you, for giving us new perspectives and also map. Is a, is, it began from a collector's collection. So it's wonderful to make that collection between our two museums. And I hope there's so much more we can do together. So thank you all for joining us this evening. We look forward to future collaborations and having a chance to see all of your presentations online and your collections and the efforts you've made to introduce people to different types of arts crafts and especially photography is appreciated everywhere. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Amy. Thank you, Banu, Janice, Kristen, and Sarah. You all have been absolute stars. We are delighted with the session. Thank you so much, Abhishek. Thank you, and MAP. Thank you. And Wonderful. thank you to our audience here for watching. <laughs> yes. Thank you to the audience. Good night. Bye. Good morning. Good night. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.